place to live. Thank you, Senator Smith. If I could just make an announcement, Senators. Senators will be aware of the announcement by the ACT government of a COVID-19 case being detected in the ACT overnight and the consequent announcement of restrictions applying to the ACT. Before I deal with the arrangements flowing from today's developments, can I again strongly urge all to continue to abide by COVID safe practices, distancing, wearing masks, checking for symptoms and isolating and testing if they appear at all. Regarding developments today, first, I urge all senators and all staff to urgently check and constantly recheck the exposure sites listed on the ACT Health website and follow all ACT public health directives, both with respect to the local restrictions generally and any that may specifically apply to individuals impacted and required to test, isolate or quarantine. Second, under the ACT public health directives, Parliament is an essential workplace. Senators and members and staff will continue to be allowed to work from Parliament House to serve their constituents and fulfil parliamentary duties. Media and journalists are also essential workers and entitled to continue their essential work out of this building. We will expand the measures already in place that we put in place for this fortnight regarding staff working from home, especially as Parliament is not sitting next week for the period of this lockdown. Third, with respect to returning home and then to the ACT for the resumption of Parliament. Further details will be circulated as they are determined by state and territory officials following consultation with the Commonwealth. However, as well as the existing requirements in place for Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia, I understand announcements have already been made by Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Um, I also understand that an announcement is likely to come regarding Queensland, but I do not have information about that yet. Importantly, it is likely that some of these additional state requirements will be made retrospective in nature, so senators intending to return to their home base should be aware of that possibility. I remind all that this building has been operating under extremely strict conditions since these sittings commenced, as strict as any time during the pandemic, with many members and senators participating remotely, around two thirds or more of bu regular building staff working remotely, catering being restricted to takeaway only, use of the check-in app, social distancing and masks inside the building with marshals, and, that they have, and extensive pairing arrangements and spacing in the chambers. These have been substantially above the local requirements of the ACT prior to this incident, specifically to reduce the risk of any transmission in this unique workplace. Again, I would like to thank both Commonwealth and ACT health, health officials for their assistance and cooperation in this matters, and I'd particularly like to thank senators and all staff in this building for their cooperation with the evolving requirements and rules. It has been critical to maintaining the operation of the National Parliament. I thank senators. Questions without notice, Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, the COVID-19 crisis continues to grow. 345 new cases have been reported in New South Wales, with 93 deaths resulting from the current New South Wales outbreak. Does Mr Morrison now regret pressuring the New South Wales Premier to avoid a hard and fast lockdown? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank the Senator uh, for her question and indeed acknowledge it continues to be a very challenging day for uh, people across many different parts of Australia, uh, as it is uh, for people across many, many different parts of the world. Uh, I reject the assertion made by the senator in terms of pressuring. Uh, it, is, uh, it is well known uh, that, uh, that throughout uh, the management of the COVID pandemic, uh, New South Wales had uh, shown an extraordinary capacity in terms of uh, their uh, testing, COVID tracing uh, and isolating regime to be able to get on top of multiple outbreaks uh, through that time. Clearly, as is publicly acknowledged and as the Prime Minister has publicly acknowledged, the Delta variant uh, has created an additional challenge for systems uh, and in relation to the increased rate of transmissibility that comes with the Delta variant. Uh, indeed, it's estimated the Delta variant results in a 100 per cent increase in relation to transmission. 
And with those changed uh, circumstances, so too, as we've had to right throughout the pandemic, uh, the advice and the approach changes appropriately too. The advice and the approach changes appropriately too. Order. Uh, we want to see Order. the New South Wales lockdown succeed. We want to see New South Wales get on top of it. It is why, as a government, we've been offering additional resources and assistance along the way to New South Wales, be that in the form of additional contact tracing support or additional support in relation to enforcement uh, of the lockdown uh, through the supply of Australian Defence Force personnel to work alongside of New South Wales Police. We will continue to deliver the support we can to assist New South Wales. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. In New South Wales, in addition to Dubbo, towns with very high Aboriginal populations like Walgut, Burke and Brewarrina have today been plunged into lockdown. Does Mr Morrison regret that despite promising First Nations Australians that they would be a priority Order. in the vaccine rollout, only 10 per cent have been vaccinated more than 18 months into the pandemic? Order. I'm going to insist. Uh, order on my right. I need to hear the question. Senator Billiam. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, the government is acutely aware of the uh, reality of uh, different regional communities uh, facing uh, lockdown and cases of COVID-19. Uh, as we've been aware, in terms of communities with uh, higher rates of Indigenous populations, of the consequences such as when the Northern Territory. Uh, has faced uh, lockdown conditions uh, as well. Uh, where possible, we deploy additional support and resources in relation to those communities. Uh, the Senator asked a question about uh, vaccine availability and, uh, and prioritisation. Uh, as is being well canvassed, uh, vaccine availability has been a challenge at times. Uh, however, I'd note that uh, in terms of some of those cohorts who have been amongst the first eligible to receive a vaccine, uh, we have seen in many of those cohorts uh, them uh, undertake that activity uh, of their own volition in numbers that have achieved very high uptake. And I urge all those uh, who are in cohorts Order, that Senator may not Birmingham, have achieved such high uptake uh, to seize every Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. While Melbourne's in lockdown, Sydney and large parts of New South Wales are in lockdown, Canberra is going into lockdown. Coalition MP Mr Christensen is saying, and I quote, we need to end all of these ridiculous zero risk, anti-freedom, anti-privacy pandemic restrictions right now. Does Mr Morrison regret putting his political interest ahead of the health of Australians by refusing to rein in Mr Christensen? Again, on my right, on my right, I need to hear the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, the government has made clear, both in uh, the other chamber and in this place, uh, views in relation to uh, uh, the comments made uh, by Mr. Christensen. Uh, the, uh, the approach of the government is clearly to make sure uh, that uh, we emphasise to Australians the importance of abiding by public health orders, by restrictions in place, uh, following advice in all circumstances, and that includes advice in relation to uh, the. Uh, vaccination rollout as well. Um, it's been deeply frustrating at times that different things uh, have indeed uh, hurt public confidence in the vaccination rollout. Uh, I've noted Professor uh, Dorr from the Kirby Institute's remarks that, uh, that we will look back on anti-AstraZenecanism uh, as one of the greatest public health failings in many years. And, uh, and whilst uh, the health advice uh, has ebbed and flowed, if you like, in relation to AZ. It's certainly been disappointing that some have exacerbated Order, that Senator in Birmingham. more extreme Time ways. For the answer has expired. Order. Senator Van. Thank you, Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Australian response to the COVID-19 pandemic, from our frontline and essential workers to our small businesses and farmers, is helping Australia address the ongoing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, from the very start uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, indeed before the World Health Organisation declared it to be a pandemic, uh, we have had uh, frontline workers, uh, be they those working on our borders, in our health systems, 
uh, or indeed the many scientists and others uh, that we rely upon for advice and information uh, doing an incredible job in the service of our country. And it is the work of all of those uh, that has enabled governments across this country uh, to achieve world-leading outcomes in terms of protecting Australians, keeping people safe uh, and achieving outcomes in the saving of lives uh, that are far in excess uh, of uh, the tragic, terrible circumstances we've seen in so much of the rest of the world. Uh, Mr President, uh, many of those are today uh, engaged in activities across the country in helping with testing, in helping with contact tracing uh, or in helping with the vaccination rollout. And we extend our thanks to all of them for all that they are doing in helping uh, the country. We extend our thanks to the many essential workers uh, in food, manufacturing, production, distribution and other industries uh, that have been so important, as well as the other care sectors who have had to step up at times when restrictions have been imposed on so many other activities. I want to acknowledge uh, the many Australians continuing to turn out in record numbers to get vaccinated. Uh, we have seen in the last 24 hours 262,314 vaccines administered across Australia. This once again, Mr President, is another daily record. Uh, to administer those vaccines, we have many GP clinics opening late at night, additional hours, alongside increasing numbers of pharmacies, uh, putting in extra hours, alongside those working in state clinics or seeking to get into specialist centres, aged care, remote populations or otherwise. It's a huge effort by those individuals in the largest peacetime Order. logistical Senator undertaking our nation has, has seen. Expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the health response by Australians, including through the vac vaccination rollout, providing the foundation for us to chart our way back from COVID-19? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, with the record number of doses administered in the last 24 hours, we now see uh, close to 14.5 million doses administered across Australia. Uh, our country is administering vaccines to the tune of, uh, of being able to provide a jab to the entire population of Adelaide uh, every single week. Uh, it has uh, been a huge scale up, as I indicated before, and in doing so, we've seen uh, some of the most important cohorts who had primary access uh, turn out in record numbers, taking responsibility for themselves in doing so, but responding to that call. Those 70 plus uh, Australians, uh, those aged over 70, some 82.2 per cent of them have now received their first dose. 49.9 per cent have now received their second dose uh, of vaccine amongst those aged over 70. Of the entire eligible population aged over 16, some 46 per cent of all Australians have now Order. received at Senator least that Birmingham. first dose. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has the Liberal and National Government's economic plan supported Australian jobs and businesses through the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. We've always been very conscious of the reality uh, that responding to COVID-19 has been about saving both lives and livelihoods. Uh, and despite the many difficulties and uncertainties that Australia and the rest of the world have faced, uh, we've continued to outperform the rest of the world in terms of saving uh, the lives of Australians, in terms of saving the jobs of Australians, the businesses of Australians and the fundamentals that will enable Australia to come out of this pandemic and more strongly than so many other nations who have been affected so much worse. Uh, prior to uh, the recent challenges of additional lockdowns across the country, uh, we saw unemployment having dipped below 5 per cent to 4.9 per cent. A comeback in terms of unemployment far exceeding expectations and, uh, and the strong jobs growth putting Australia in a position of seeing uh, employment at levels uh, in excess of pre-pandemic. Our economic responses have helped achieve these outcomes and we continue to deliver record Order. support Senator to families, Birmingham. households Time and businesses the answer to get has them through expired. this. Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. When asked about Mr Christensen's disinformation, Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, said, and I quote, if you start prodding the bear, you're going to make the situation worse for us as a government, not better. What does Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister mean? 
The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the Senator for his question. Um, I listened to Barnaby Joyce's interview, uh, as so many Australians did, on RN uh, yesterday, where this question was canvassed, and he was very clear that he does not go to Mr Christensen for advice on how to uh, protect his family and his community around COVID. He does not agree with uh, George Christensen's views on lockdowns, masks and other things. But what he does do is absolutely support Mr Christensen's right as uh, a citizen of a free country and as uh, a community member to have an opinion and to express it. Now, we have, not, we have seen numerous times in this place uh, individuals take to Facebook, take to public platforms to express views which we don't agree with, whether it's supporting criminals like uh, those to my right, order. the Greens. Senator Wong on a point of order. Mr President, um, the direct relevance, Senator Ayer's question was to ask the person who represents Mr Joyce in this chamber what, a direct quote, if you start prodding the bear you're going to make, make the situation worse for us as a government, what he meant. So on the, on the point of order, um, it is a quite a broad question but in my view it does need to be restricted to meanings or potential meanings or imputations of that particular comment rather than observations on others to be directly relevant. Um, but it is very broad. I, I must say, in that sense. So I call Senator McKenzie to continue. <laughs> Thank you. And as I was saying, um, people in this place, on their Facebook pages, on the floor of this chamber, and in public. Order, Senator Wong, on the point of order. I can probably, minister, I can probably guess it. The, yep. the, the minister, Mr. President, she can't just ignore your ruling. I, I'm going to ask Senator McKenzie that um, I did say that observations on others I didn't think were in order when the question was what does the Deputy Prime Minister mean? That is a broad question, but I do believe that it needs to be limited to meanings, potential meanings or otherwise of that statement rather than observations upon others. Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, as to, I think what, uh, if I could paraphrase what I think uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and was talking about was reflecting on Mr Christensen's comments uh, in the chamber and clearly articulating that he didn't support them, that he uh, supported following the medical advice and uh, he himself is also following the health advice right now as he is in lockdown in Armidale, uh, New South Wales, as a result of uh, a state health order in that state. So, Barnaby Joyce, as the Deputy Prime Minister, has been clarified those comments. He doesn't agree Order, with Senator George McKenzie Christensen, but he agrees with his right to say five. it. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. The Deputy Prime Minister has also said, and I quote, and I'll say that to my colleagues, I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. Did Mr Morrison's Deputy Prime Minister give that advice to the Prime Minister? Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, I'm obviously not in ev privy to every conversation that the Deputy Prime Minister and Prime Minister have, and nor should I be. Uh, so I'll have to take that on notice. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Why does Mr Morrison continue to prioritise protecting his own job over protecting the jobs and lives of ordinary Australians? When will he finally take responsibility and stand up to the extreme elements of his own party room who are spreading dangerous misinformation? Senator McKenzie. Well, I completely reject the premise of Senator Ayres' question. How absolutely ridiculous. The Prime Minister, our government and I would have hoped the entire parliament here in Canberra's one focus for the last 18 months should be assisting Australians to get through this global pandemic together, making sure we encourage people to get vaccinated. Even AstraZeneca. We've got a chief medical officer in Queensland who can't even say the word. AstraZeneca. 
where there is no vaccination shortage if you're going to actually choose to that particular vaccination. Working with states and territories, we've got millions of Australians right down in lockdown, lockdown and they're not able to get to work. It is our government that is actually supporting them with individual disaster payments should they lose hours of work. It is our government, in partnership with both Liberal and Labor state governments, supporting those small businesses who are subject uh, to lockdown. So Order, that when Senator McKenzie, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. The IPCC report released this week was the code red for humanity. We are on track to tip over one and a half degrees of warming this decade unless we drastically change course. The Morrison government has nowhere left to hide, and you've even been singled out by the US government for not lifting your targets. Will you lift Australia's 2030 targets? Or will you keep us in the sole company of petro states Russia and Saudi Arabia? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Waters uh, for her question and the opportunity, indeed, to, uh, to talk about uh, Australia's targets, our commitment as a country to meeting our targets, our delivery as a country in exceeding our targets, and our determination to maintain uh, that sort of track record in relation to Australia's emissions reduction targets. Uh, because as a country, uh, we can, should, contrary to what comes from uh, those in that corner or indeed the misinformation from those opposite, we should hold our head high about the fact that as a nation, when we've made commitments to the world about our emissions reduction targets, we've delivered on those commitments and we've exceeded uh, those commitments. Uh, and that's been a constant pattern for Australia. Uh, in terms of uh, our Paris targets, our commitment is also to be able to meet and to exceed those targets. That's our determination in relation to what we're doing, building off the fact that since 2005, Australia has seen a 20 per cent reduction in our emissions. That's been faster than Canada at 1 per cent, Japan at 10 per cent, New Zealand at 4 per cent, the US at 13 per cent. As I've said before in this chamber, I don't mention that as a criticism of those places, but simply to put into perspective what Australia has been able to achieve. It's been done with transformation across Australia in terms of Australian industry transforming, uh, the energy generation mix transforming, and of course uh, Australian households transforming their behaviour as well. That's seen, for example, in 2020 some seven gigawatts of renewable energy generation capacity installed in Australia in 2020 alone. It's at a rate around eight times faster than New Zealand or Japan or Italy. It's around three times faster than in Germany, the US, China or the EU. And indeed, one in four Australian households now have rooftop solar showing that rate of trans, trans, uh, transition that Australians are helping Order. to make. Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The US Deputy Climate Envoy said overnight that Australians' targets are, quote, not sufficient and that we should be considering at least 50 per cent by 2030. That is an unprecedented public rebuke. You copied the US target in 2015, albeit giving yourself five extra years to meet it. Will you now copy the US and double Australia's 2030 targets? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're going to get on with ensuring that we don't just talk about targets, but in exceeding those targets, we do it by investing in the technologies to actually reduce emissions, to achieve the outcomes that reduce emissions. You know, Australia uh, generates around 1 per cent of global emissions. It's important that we do our part. But it's even more important in terms of achieving a reduction in global emissions that we help to achieve the breakthroughs in technology and the transformations that mean we are acting in concert with other nations, like the United States, but also like China or India or other nations who have higher emissions profiles than Australia. Our intention is to make sure that we deliver on the $20 billion of low emissions technologies and commitments we've made for the decade ahead. Uh, that's part of building on our partnerships we've signed with Singapore, Japan, Germany, the UK to deliver the technologies that will help the US, Australia and many other partner Order, nations Senator and others Birmingham. around the world Time for the to reduce our expired. emissions. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The Deputy Prime Minister yesterday on ABC Radio called on someone to do a plan to reach net zero. 
putting aside the fact that uh, he has been in government for seven years, have any departments been instructed by any ministers to do any planning for this crucial life-saving work of a plan to reach net zero? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. The answer to that is absolutely. Absolutely uh, they have. That's precisely what our technology investment roadmap is all about, getting the breakthroughs in technology to enable us to be able to achieve emissions reductions, to enable us to chart that course to net zero, to enable us to do it in ways that maintain Australia's competitiveness, maintain the employment uh, and opportunities for jobs for Australians, maintain position for Australian businesses. That roadmap outlines the work that we are pursuing, our target to achieve clean hydrogen of under $2 per kilogram, our targets to achieve energy storage at under $100 per megawatt hour, our target to achieve carbon capture and storage at under $20 per tonne of CO2, our target to achieve low carbon steel of under $900 per tonne or low carbon aluminium of under $2,700 per tonne, our target to be able to measure and achieve soil carbon improvements at under $3 per hectare. Getting those targets achieved is how you make Order. transformation Senator here Birmingham. and Time abroad. The answer has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Um, well, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In defending his own disinformation campaign, Senator Canavan has declared today that throughout the pandemic there has not been, and I quote, even a scintilla of parliamentary accountability. Does this minister agree with Canavan when he says that the Morrison-Joyce government has been completely unaccountable through the pandemic? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. No, Senator, I don't agree because you're taking the comments quite significantly out of context. I was sitting in the chamber when Senator Canavan was making those comments. I was sitting in the chamber and I know full well, I know full well that Order. in making those comments, Senator Canavan was challenging public health orders issued by states and territories that are made by regulation, by edict, without reference to their parliaments. Now it's up for each of those state and territories to defend their positions, and indeed I know many of them have probably in cases, of course, presented in parliamentary committees or other formats. Uh, but in terms of the Morrison government, we've made sure we're here today answering your questions. We've made sure through the establishment of the COVID uh, Select Committee that we have fronted up countless times our officials have fronted up to answer the questions of the opposition, to answer other questions, to submit ourselves to the scrutiny of this parliament and of the processes and procedures, as is only reasonable, Mr President. We front up, we handle that scrutiny, we submit ourselves to it. That's exactly what we're doing right now. But contorting or twisting words out of context, put pitching them in terms of pretending somehow that this parliament hasn't had scrutiny, hasn't had opportunity to do so, that's just not true. This parliament has. I don't believe that's what Senator Canavan was suggesting in his remarks. I believe he was making references to other decisions elsewhere. That's for him to defend, for others to engage in. But Senator, I think, but Senator, I think you are misleading in terms of the construct of the question that you have put. We are here, engaged in the scrutiny and accountability. I'm sure you, Senator Sheldon, have pursued the opportunities and estimates and otherwise to hold the government to accountable. And I've got no doubt that all of you, in particular Senator Gallagher as chair of the Select Committee, will continue to do so throughout the course of the pandemic. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. As Senator Canavan has defended himself, saying spreading disinformation is, and I quote, Order. speaking about a particular viewpoint that is our job. Does Mr Morrison agree? Senator Birmingham. No, and Mr President, I didn't quite catch the quote that was, uh, that was referenced then. Um, I mean, it is the job of members and senators to uh, indeed bring perspectives uh, to this parliament from their communities, on behalf of their communities, and to do that. I urge, the government urges everyone to do that in the most responsible way possible. We don't control the words that come out of the mouths of every member or senator. Uh, but I urge them to do so in the most responsible way possible. I urge all of those who engage in public discourse across this country 
to engage in it in the most responsible way possible. I referenced concern about the vaccine rollout in an earlier response and the fact that we've seen this anti-AstraZeneca um, mythology built up by some, led, sadly, by even some public health officials, such as the incoming Governor of Queensland. That's disappointing that we've seen those sorts of mistakes in terms of the language used by others made, and Order, I'd urge them all Senator to make sure they apply the temperate, has thoughtful. Expired. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. And one of Mr Morrison's own cabinet ministers told Nikki Sava that Mr Morrison's philosophy is, and I quote, if you see a problem, throw money at it. If you see a problem, walk away from it. If you see a problem, duck sharp to somebody else. Isn't the dangerous disinformation campaign being run from his own party room just another problem Mr Morrison is walking away from? Order. Order. <coughs> Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I, I reject the premise behind that question. I reject the assertion in Ms. Sava's article, uh, and of course, you know, having a question uh, from a member of the opposition about throwing money at a problem is really, of course, quite an astounding proposition. Quite an astounding proposition that those opposite uh, would decide to hone in on an anonymous quote and suggest that uh, that somehow throwing money at a problem is a bad thing. Well, Mr. President. Those opposite know no other solution to most problems than to throw money at it. Of course, you know, whilst pretending to take a bipartisan approach to issues in the pandemic, they've also been none too shy in terms of saying that the government should not bring JobKeeper to an end, but then criticising the spending on JobKeeper. Uh, they've you know, come out with policies such as last week's thought bubble around the $300 uh, payments to all Australians, including the millions who have already been vaccinated. And of course, we know they want to talk about cabinet process. That one didn't even go through the shadow cabinet process. It was a surprise Order, to Mr. Butler, Senator the shadow Birmingham. health Time minister of all people, didn't question. even know about it. Answer has expired. I will now then move to Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals Government economic plan is supporting workers and businesses to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and get to the other side? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. I do acknowledge that One Nation did have the call. Um, yes, but they're... Uh, my understanding oh, is my Senator apologies. Hanson I had, had the call. Sorry. Um, I will go then to them next. I had Senator Roberts on the list provided to me, so I didn't see you, Senator Hanson. I will come to you next. It'll just be a switch. Um, the, yeah, I wasn't advised of the change, and I didn't see you trying to get my attention. My apologies. So if I'll go to this question, then I'll do that question next. That'll just be a, an easy switch. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator Hughes for the question. And in particular, I acknowledge Senator Hughes' um, work that she's done in relation to ensuring that uh, regional businesses and rural businesses in Australia are supported throughout COVID-19. Uh, Mr President, as I think we would all acknowledge, small and family business uh, are well and truly the lifeblood of the Australian economy, but in particular uh, our communities, our rural and rental communities. And, and these businesses have been and are the key to Australia's recovery from COVID-19. And without a doubt, those small businesses will be the key to our future economic success. Mr President, when we look at what happened, has happened in the ACT today, small businesses have not had it easy throughout COVID-19. They have faced many challenges with lockdowns and restrictions severely impacting their operations. But Mr President, any of us who have dealt with a small business we know that they have faced up to those challenges and they are doing their best to get through COVID-19. And the Morrison government is backing them every step of the way. In terms of the support that we have been able to provide uh, small businesses, it's around $300 billion in direct health and economic support since the pandemic began has reached our shores to support these businesses, to support the essential workers, but also to keep Australians in jobs throughout 
the pandemic. This extensive economic support, and this obviously includes JobKeeper, the apprentices' wage subsidy, and that important cash flow boost, giving back to small businesses uh, what they themselves have actually earned. That saw Australia's unemployment rate come down to a record low of 4.9 per cent. Mr President, the Morrison government, we will continue to back small businesses every step of the way, because we know they're doing it tough, but we want them to prosper and grow Order, and create Cash. more jobs. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the government supporting businesses and protecting jobs through the current lockdowns and restrictions resulting from the pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the outbreaks that we are currently sealing illustrate, uh, Australia and Australians, we're not out of the woods yet. The Morrison government, we continue to work with the states and the territories to help their businesses and to support their staff that are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, in partnership with the South Australian government, we've provided a $40 million support package for around 20,000 businesses in South Australia. In July, we reached agreement with the Victorian government and we are providing around $200 million to help support Victorian small and medium businesses. And in New South Wales, we have an agreement with the New South Wales government where businesses with a turnover of up to $250 million who have lost 30 per cent or more of turnover or have just seen a decline of 30 per cent or more in turnover, they will be eligible for payments of up to $100,000 per week. Again, we are providing the economic support, working with states Order. and territories Cash, to Senator help Hughes, these businesses. A final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, whilst uh, those opposite are clearly supporting the airlines by fleeing lockdown as quick as possible and not sharing it with Canberra, how can every single Australian help small and family businesses and their workers to not only get through the current challenges but ensure our economic recovery from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I think we all acknowledge in this place that everybody's personal circumstances are just that, their own personal circumstances. Uh, and certainly we also all know that in relation to uh, small businesses, uh, the best thing that we can do at this point in time is to assist them by getting vaccinated. The Prime Minister, alongside the states and territories, have worked to develop our fourth place plan to see us through COVID-19 and to get us out the other side. As more and more Australians get vaccinated, and it is pleasing to see that the vaccination rates in Australia, uh, they are accelerating. It took us, I think, six days to get from 13 million to 14 million. What we are doing there is we are protecting Australians against the virus. Getting vaccinated, as we all know, it protects you, it protects your family, and it protects your community. We want to see small and family businesses in particular prosper and grow, and one of the things we can do collectively Order. is Senator get vaccinated. Cash, time for the Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Hanson, once again, my apologies. We'll come to you now. Problem. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is on behalf of Senator Roberts, and, it, and it's for Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister for Health. Despite having over 63% of Israel's population vaccinated for both Pfizer doses, on Monday, Israel recorded 3,372 new COVID cases up from less than 300 a little over a month ago, an 11-fold surge. The effect of COVID vaccinations may be wearing off, with studies in Israel on the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccinations showing it is only 39 per cent effective. Pfizer recently admitted that immunity from its two-dose vaccine is waning and will seek FDA authorisation for a third booster dose. Randomised control trials show no evidence of the provisionally approved vaccines having any prolonged efficiency. Minister, do you agree or acknowledge these facts? If not, then what Order. is the vaccine Senator efficiency? Hansen. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and thanks, Senator Hanson, -Young for, Hanson for the question. My apologies. Um, Mr. President, the, the concept of requirement of booster vaccines has, is something that the government has 
had as a part of its strategy for a considerable period of time. As you would be aware, uh, the Moderna vaccines that, are current, that have recently been uh, approved, uh, a proportion of those are under consideration for utilisation as booster doses. Uh, the fact that this is a new virus, the vaccines for the virus are new, uh, the concept of the, 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 the life of the vaccine and the period that antibodies were retained in the, in the human body was always a question. So, Mr President, the, the concept of a booster vaccine uh, has always been something that we've been considering. Uh, and we have plentiful supplies in our vaccine supply strategy for that. Uh, as we see the evidence that comes from these other jurisdictions that ha have higher vaccin vaccination rates and have vaccinated before us, we will clearly consider that information and we will incorporate the learnings from that into our mechanisms for the completion of the, of the continuation of the vaccination rollout, whether that be the Moderna dose or whether that be a variant of the vaccines that are being uh, proposed, considered and developed by a number of other vaccine manufacturers, Mr President. So the concept of requiring a booster vaccine uh, is not a new one. It's something the government has always been considering. It, it sits already as a part of our considerations. Uh, and of course, Mr President, once we get to the stage of, of understanding that better through the evidence that we are receiving from other jurisdictions around the world, uh, the requirements for that, the operation for Order, that. Order, Senator Colbeck. Be time for the answer has justice. expired. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Minister, in light of what you, your comments there and saying it's new, and, and I acknowledge that, the fact is that we don't know how often the vaccine is going to have to be administered. Can you give it, are the people any indication of how often that vaccine will have to be administered and at whose cost? So every time it is administered, is that a cost to the taxpayers? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, at this point in time, the government is running a national vaccination program that provides access to a vaccine to every Australian who wants one. That is the program that we're running. Uh, and, it, and it may very well be that the vaccination program needs to continue for a period of time until we get to the stage where um, we've, at a global level, dealt with this virus. Um, there are some questions that we don't know the answer to. If you'd spoken to anyone six months ago, the concept of the Delta virus and the impact that it's currently having across the world, uh, as you've quite rightly stated in your question, uh, was clearly not understood. The virus continues to mutate. We're not going to understand uh, in advance of its, its mutations what those mutations might be, and we have to be prepared to move quickly to adapt to those things uh, as it continues to evolve, Mr President. So the vaccination program uh, will go for a considerable period of time and the taxpayer, Order, the government... Senator, Tolbeck, uh, Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Well, thank you very much. By the, if we're dealing with the uh, Delta strain now, um, what is the government's plan of moving forward if this Delta strain changes into another strain? So how, what is your plan in actually moving forward with that? And can you assure the people that the vaccinations that have been given now, which indicates in Israel they haven't got the same immunity rate, what is your plan to move forward and to deal with the next strain that comes through? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Hanson, for her question. Uh, we will continue to follow the latest science in the development of vaccines globally uh, to ensure that we can offer to Australians safe, and efficacious vaccines. Uh, that's what we've done with the, with the programs that we have underway right now. And we can, as you've heard many times in this chamber, we continue to expand uh, both the volume of each vaccine that we have and the availability of different types of vaccines, Mr. President. And I'm sure that the medical fraternity will continue to do as they've done over the last 18 months, which is continue to research the new variants of the virus as they evolve and as they emerge, and they will continue to adapt the vaccines to deal with those. We are very fortunate in this country right now, Mr. President, we have uh, access to very good vaccines that are safe and provide protection against death, hospitalisation and serious illness. 
Senator Faruqi remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. As of yesterday, Fortress Australia has further tightened its borders. Under the strict new rules, even Australian citizens and permanent residents who ordinarily live in another country will need to seek exemptions to leave Australia if they come back temporarily and could very well be denied the exemption. The changes have been made without warning and have caused anxiety and fear. As it is, 38,000 Australians are still stranded overseas with many desperate to return home. Minister, why are you inflicting unnecessary pain and further anguish on people who are already separated from their loved ones and some with seriously sick family members and who will now be further restricted from coming here because they may not be able to return to the countries that they live in? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, Senator Faruqi. Uh, you and I are going to have to differ in relation to uh, the government's response, or your opinion of the government's response to keeping Australians safe. Australia's strong border control system has undoubtedly, Mr. President, been a major factor in our success in managing as a country COVID-19, in particular when you look at the global situation. The Morrison government acted swiftly at the commencement of COVID-19 to ensure that Australians remained safe. Mr President, in relation to the border and travel exemption regime, of course, I think it's without a doubt, the closed border and travel exemption regime are underpinned by a system of quarantine designed to ensure that people returning do not present a threat to the community. In relation to the changes uh, to the outbound travel arrangements that Senator Faruqi refers to, as a government, we have sought unap unapologetically to take measures that combat the virus whilst also respecting the rights and freedoms of people. The government's pandemic response is consistent with legal and with health advice and is targeted at most effectively protecting Australians from COVID-19. We work closely, Mr President, as you know, with the states and the territories through National Cabinet to ensure that our COVID-19 response is both measured and appropriate. And in fact, Senator Faruqi, I note that the federal court has consistently found in favour of the government in previous challenges to Australia's border restrictions. Mr President, in relation to the changes that Senator Faruqi refers to... Order, this... Senator Cash. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, we are a nation with close to 30 per cent of the population born overseas and a further 20 per cent who have at least one parent born overseas. Do you accept that these unnecessary and harsh restrictions are hurting tens of thousands and will disproportionately impact people from multicultural backgrounds? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what I would say to Senator Faruqi is this. COVID-19, Senator Faruqi, affects everybody. I mean, you've seen in the ACT today a seven-day lockdown. It is affecting people in the ACT. It will affect people more broadly. But when it comes to decisions in relation to Australia's borders, it is a fact, Senator Faruqi, that our strong border control system has undoubtedly, undoubtedly been a major factor in our success in managing COVID-19. In terms of the changes that you have referred to, as you would be aware, it does not stop Australians who normally reside overseas from leaving Australia. All we have done is remove the automatic exemption. Australians who genuinely reside overseas and are seeking to return to their country of residence, they are still able to do so. But we can't make apologies Order, for our Cash, strong Senator border Faruqi, control system. Senator a final system. supplementary question. Minister, your government has put in another barrier for people living overseas to come back here because they fear that they won't be able to go back to their place of residence. All this while the rich and the famous, the well-connected and far-right trolls are allowed to swan in and out of Australia. Minister, do you think it's fair that the rich and famous are allowed in, while ordinary people are left 
to suffer in silence? Senator Cash. Well, again, Senator Faruqi, I don't agree with the assertions that you have put in place. Anyone who seeks to come into Australia or, at this point in time, exit Australia, uh, they are decisions that are made by the appropriate authorities in Australia. Mr President, again, Australia has put in place strong border control systems and they have undoubtedly, undoubtedly been a major factor in our success in managing COVID-19. Our role as a government is to keep Australia and Australians safe. That does not mean that every measure is going to be supported by, as you can see here, the Australian Greens. But our role as a government is to keep Australians safe. And in terms of the measures that we have put in place in relation to our strong control, our strong border control system, they have undoubtedly been a major factor in keeping Australian safe. Order. Senator Farrell. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, uh, Senator McKenzie. And I refer to the Minister's statements last week in relation to her role in the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program. As the former Minister for Sport, did the Minister provide the Health Department with permission to access documents created in her office in relation to the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program for the purpose of those documents being provided to the Secretary of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr Philip Gaitchens. The Minister for Re uh, Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, there's been copious public commentary around sports grants. I have given a 6,000-word uh, submission to the inquiry from this place. I've uh, attended a Senate inquiry. I will let my comments on the public record, which are order. Uh, Senator McKenzie, very exhaustive, I have Senator uh, Farrell stand. on a point of order. Senator Farrell on a point of order. Well, I was seeking the call while the minister was um, still speaking, um, but it was a very specific question um, which could have easily had a yes or no answer. Well, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. If the minister is referring to a minister's previous comments, that can be directly relevant. Um, I'm not in a position to judge it otherwise. There is an opportunity, as always, to debate questions after question time, but I can't instruct the minister the terms in which to answer a question. Senator McKenzie, have you concluded? Yes. You have. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yeah, I, I do have a further question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, based on his analysis of the grants awarded and the list of marginal and targeted seats included in those documents, Mr Gaitens claims that grants were awarded at a similar rate across other electorates. Uh, the minister herself has uh, repeated those claims. Does she still stand by those claims? Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator, for your question. Uh, I stand by all my public commentary around the sports grants and I refer you to my previous statements. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Look, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, well, if that's the case, uh, will she now give permission to the Health Department to provide those documents that I've been referring to to the Senate? And if not, why not? Senator McKenzie. Uh, Mr President, I have nothing more to add uh, other than my very copious uh, public statements on this matter. Senator Davey. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is also to the, um, Senator McKenzie, the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, can the minister please update the Senate on how regional Australians are doing their bit as part of the Australian response to the health and economic challenges through the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd like to thank, thank Senator Davey for her question and her long-standing support for rural and regional New South Wales. We are standing with your communities, especially those in regional New South Wales uh, who have currently been put into lockdown. COVID-19 has been an unprecedented uh, impact not only 
here in Australia but right across the world. More than four million lives have been lost globally, and we're facing the largest global economic shock since the Great Depression. Early and decisive action by our government in conjunction with state governments saved 30,000 lives and millions of jobs. We closed our borders, the Prime Minister established the National Cabinet, and we invested over $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals and businesses to reduce the impact. We know these measures have had a significant impact on all Australians, both mentally, socially and financially, and no one knows that better than those that live in rural and regional areas. The ongoing impact of COVID-19 and the stop-start, sporadic nature of lockdowns, especially in regional New South Wales, with Hunter, Valley, Tamworth and Armidale just recently being declared Commonwealth uh, hotspots, uh, does take its toll. However, this frustration pales to the difficulties we'd face if we didn't do everything we could, could to stop the spread. Regional Australians are doing the right thing, lining up in droves, pulling up their sleeves, getting vaccinated, with over 3.7 million Australians in rural and regional Australia uh, being, getting their jabs. That's increasing day on day, each and every day. Our First Nations people are also rolling up their sleeves. And as of this morning, more than 160,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, nearly 30 per cent, have received at least one dose. Community pharmacies right across the country have kept their doors open and are now playing their role in regional communities rolling out the vaccine. Our government has allocated nearly $48 Order, million. Senator dollars. McKenzie. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, Minister, how is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting rural and regional communities as we chart our way back from COVID? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Our government has provided a raft of support to regional communities through the COVID-19 pandemic. That's why we're delivering highly targeted financial assistance through the COVID disaster payment to workers who live or work in a Commonwealth declared hotspot. It's specifically tailored to workers impacted by those lockdowns and Services Australia has already processed more than 1.8 million COVID disaster payment claims, paying out more than $2 billion to workers to date. And we will not stop standing with individuals as they feel in a very uh, individual way the impact of those lockdowns and when they're doing the right thing and staying home and stopping the spread. In addition to this, the pandemic leave disaster payment supports those who would have who've been directed by a state official to isolate for more than 14 days. We've also ensured that staff at Meatworks have been identified as a high priority job role in the first two phases of the vaccine rollout so that we can actually support uh, our agricultural Order, industries. Senator McKenzie, Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, why is regional Australia so critical to the success of our economic recovery post-COVID? Senator McKenzie. Regional Australia is critical to driving our economy post-COVID. We know that agriculture and mining are key industries that stabilise our economic growth. We know that uh, by supporting the agricultural industry, we're not, uh, we've supported international freight task as supply chains have been challenged by COVID-19 and additionally when our own domestic supply to supermarkets, particularly last year, was challenged. It was by setting up uh, transport, uh, transport arrangements, making sure that we could get food from farm to distribution centre uh, to supermarkets so that Australia who were in lockdown could still access high quality food. We've negotiated an agricultural visa, uh, which we look to addressing some of those workforce shortages that are as a result of our international uh, border closures. Every single step of the way, our government is supporting Australians in rural and regional Australia uh, to get through this pandemic and to come outside stronger. Senator McAllister, remotely. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. It's reported the Morrison-Joyce government's COVID-19 information on the Health Department website, which comes in more than 60 languages, has not been updated for almost eight weeks. Does the Minister agree with the Health Department that failing to update information eight weeks out of date is, and I quote, a short delay? When will this be fixed? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator McAllister, for the question. 
can I say, Mr. President, I do agree with Senator McAllister that ensuring that Australians have access to updated information with respect to vaccines and the elements of how they might protect themselves from the COVID-19 pandemic through utilisation of a vaccine is extremely important. I would agree with her that it's a very important thing to do. Uh, Mr. President, that information has in fact been updated. Uh, but I, can I say it should have been updated sooner. It should not have taken eight weeks. I, uh, and uh, Mr. President, uh, the Department of Health understand the perspective of the ministers uh, in the portfolio with respect to that information, Mr. President. Mr. President, we don't only rely on the Department of Health website for the engagement with cold communities. Uh, this is a very, very important part of ensuring people understand uh, what's available to them with respect of um, getting a vaccine, Mr. President. So in, in, the, in that context, uh, the Arm Yourself TV commercial has been translated uh, into a number of languages um, and has been running since the 1st of August. Uh, there are 20 languages covered in videos of multicultural health professional, religious and community leaders from Sydney on the importance of staying home, getting tested and getting vaccinated, specifically for this greater Sydney region. Uh, Mr. President, uh, there is a, an established called communication working group uh, that was set up at the start of the, the pandemic. It's chaired by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Michael Kidd, and meets regularly with uh, providing advice both to the Department of Health and back out to communities, Mr. President. So communication is extremely important uh, and this information should have been updated sooner. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. The Arabic translation on the Morrison Joyce government's Department of Health website doesn't even mention that adults in Greater Sydney should strongly consider getting any vaccine. Why? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to Senator McAllister for the question. Um, Mr. President, as I've indicated, the materials on the website have been updated. Um, is, that is the advice that I've been provided. Mr. President, uh, the objective of this government is to ensure and to encourage every Australian who is currently eligible and who becomes eligible to receive a vaccine to have access to the most up-to-date information and to encourage all Australians to get a vaccine. The thing that we do know about the vaccines that we have available in our uh, vaccine strategy at this point in time is that they are safe and they are highly efficacious. They will protect you against death, hospitalisation and serious illness. So we're encouraging everyone to get a vaccine uh, as soon as they possibly can, Mr President, and that will remain a focus of our campaigns. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks. Uh, Dr Ken McCrory, a GP in the southwestern Sydney suburb of Campbelltown, said there was a clear link between low vaccination rates and poor public health messaging. He said this, we are at a serious state of despair with the website being way out of date. Will the Morrison-Joyce government take responsibility for its failure to order vaccines, its failure to distribute vaccines, and its failure to give timely and accurate advice to the millions of Australians languishing in lockdown? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, the government has clearly stated on many occasions that it is responsible for the supply and delivery of vaccines to Australians so that they can access um, a vaccine in a timely way. Mr President, as I've indicated uh, to the Chamber already, the information on that Department of Health website should have been updated in a more timely way. It has been updated now. Uh, Mr. President, and we will continue to do uh, to work with uh, communities across this country through various mechanisms to ensure that Australians have access to high quality information uh, in a way that they can uh, readily receive it so that we can continue to encourage them to access the vaccines because we know the vaccine program is going to be one of the most important ways we work with Australians to come through this COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Birmingham. 
President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child Care Subsidy Bill 2021 and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendment to the bill that the Senate requested. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. I amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Birmingham and Mackenzie to the questions asked today by Senator Ayres and myself. I, I want to commence my remarks by um, acknowledging the ripple of fear and shock and distress that's rippling through this place here today as the ACT goes into lockdown. It's been uh, miraculously avoided here, and now the anxiety that has gripped the Victorians for so many months and is now in its eighth week uh, in New South Wales coming on, we know how difficult this is. But we hear the problems of Australians being cast aside in the responses that we received from Minister Birmingham today. He will drop his voice and be very serious and sensible in his, his elocution of the government's continuing failing response. The Morrison-Joyce government has let this virus get away from us, and it is now running rampant right across the country and out into my great state of New South Wales and into very, very vulnerable communities. It's no wonder that the disapproval rating for the rollout is nearly at 60 per cent. Malcolm Turnbull, actually telling the truth, said, I can't think of a bigger black and white failure of public administration than this, and that is about his own colleagues with whom he shared a party room. The Liberal National Party, in government for eight years, supposedly great managers of the economy, People trusted them to do the right thing, and here we are at this juncture in this country where the place is literally ravaged with COVID-19 spreading at an extraordinary rate across the entire country. The virus has spread, certainly to Dubbo, to Walgett. That's nearly eight hours away from Sydney, and I know it's not as far as some of the distances that are driven in Queensland and the Northern Territory, but it's still a pretty big state. Walgett, Bathurst, Dubbo, the Shires of Bogan, Burke, Brewarrina, Coonamble, Gilgandra, Narromine and Warren, all now in lockdown. And do not forget that this experience of lockdown, this inaccessibility of vaccine, was brought to you by the stars of the show, Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce. They're the two leaders who are responsible for the decision-making that has led us to this day. 345 people in New South Wales were found to have, uh, to have acquired COVID in the last 24 hours. We know just in the last two months since this most recent outbreak, there have been 36 deaths and 93 deaths from the current uh, outbreak. We know that this is a huge toll on families, on businesses, on communities. And part of the reason we're in this situation is because the golden girl, the Premier, Berejiklian, was encouraged to hold out against going into lockdown. We've got Indigenous communities right across this state, including those in Dubbo, who are in a great deal of worry about being able to access, their, access services and get the vaccinations that they so desperately need. I was in uh, the seat of Dubbo, uh, in Dubbo, in the seat of Parks, uh, earlier this year, and I met with the Aboriginal Medical Service. They're funded. They're funded for four full-time GPs. They've only got one. They can't roll out to the Aboriginal community. I met with the group in Daniloquin, the Daniloquin Health Action Group, Marion McGee, who's been there for 32 years as a general specialist. What are their concerns? Health professional staffing, the ability to provide medical services to children, access to medical services. That is the disaster. The context into which. This failed government is actually embedding further and further problems. And those opposite might smile and think that this is some sort of a joke, but it isn't. 
My colleague on the Central Coast, the great Labor member Emma McBride, and I have been fighting, fighting to get a vaccination hub for the 350,000 people on the Central Coast. That's bigger than the population of the Northern Territory. What did the Liberal member Newsy Week say? We don't need it. The GPs are enough. Not good enough. This is what's happening on the Central Coast and the ignoring of 350,000 people in one area. The failed delivery of leadership by this Liberal National Party is a warning to the people of Dubbo. I want to encourage the great work of Councillor Stephen Lawrence, the Mayor of Dubbo, for his great leadership and his contribution to public debate this morning. And I urge all Australians to stay safe because if you don't look after yourself, this government is Thank not looking you, after you. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, I said yesterday it was like Groundhog Day, and here we go again. I mean, we know where this vaccine hesitancy is coming from, and it's certainly got nothing to do with supply. We know that there is more supply throughout Australia for any Australian that wants it. We know that day after day, including yesterday, the day before and the day before that, we saw record days of vaccinations occurring. Over a quarter of a million Australians are being vaccinated every single day. There is no supply issue. But what we do know is when you look across some of the states is there's vaccine hesitancy. There's brand shopping. And why would that be? Considering the Otago advice is now that all of the vaccines, whatever vaccine you can access, are equally effective, are equally safe, and are equally hundreds of thousands of times more, less likely to injure and kill you than COVID. But those opposite persist and continue to persist with this absolutely you know, hyperbole around supply. But really what they're talking about is we don't want to talk about AstraZeneca. We don't want to support Australian jobs. We don't want to support Australian manufacturing. We want to continue a fear and a smear campaign around vaccine brands. I mean, it is just ludicrous. The opposition leader, or the current opposition leader, can barely bring himself to even say the name. And the fact that he then raced out as quickly as possible to find a candidate for the seat of Higgins who has been active and out there suggesting people not get the AstraZeneca. This is against all health advice. Thank goodness we have sensible commentators like Dr Nick Coatesworth who are encouraging Australians to get vaccinated, who know that the best vaccine for you is the one that is, in, that is available. We are seeing Australians out in record numbers getting their vaccination and ensuring that Australia can open up as soon as is possible, but also keeping Australians safe. As we enter into lockdown here in Canberra, as those, and I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have all stayed put today, that understand that they need to be here to support the Canberrans as they go through this, but also to ensure that Parliament is able to continue to conduct itself as best as possible. But as we stay here in Canberra and enter this lockdown, we know that Canberra and the ACT has done extremely well when it comes to vaccination rate. In fact, it is getting very close to 30 per cent at full vaccination. It is over 50 per cent of one dose. But what is even more impressive is when you look at the vaccination rates going into those vulnerable cohorts. We are looking at numbers in the 80 and 90 per cent range. So I think there can be some confidence when we look at the ACT with a seven day sharp lockdown that because of the compliance that we're likely to see, because of the way that people will conduct themselves over the next seven days, the fact that the contact tracers are already working hard with the gentleman that's been affected and ensuring that those close contacts are identified as soon as possible. But the fact that there are significantly high vaccination rates within the ACT, the chance of people contracting the virus, the, people, the chance of people infecting others with the virus, and the fact that people are less likely to get majorly ill or find themselves in hospital or worse still on a ventilator or die via the, via the uh, virus is significantly reduced because of these levels of vaccines and the vaccination rate that we need to keep encouraging. And we need to keep encouraging people to get out there. I am intrigued as to whether or not we'll start to see 
another fear campaign because we know you guys just can't stay away from them and whether or not we're going to start to see a move away from the Pfizer and now you're going to be out there starting to encourage people that they should just really be looking at the, the Moderna. I mean, this spoilt for choice, you guys aren't going to know which way to go, how to scare Australians. I mean, disgracefully today on Capitol Hill on ABC when I was there with Senator McAllister, yet again, today, at, after half past one this afternoon, there Senator McAllister was spreading more information about a lack of supply. It is absolutely shameful behaviour. It is time that it stopped. It is time that you started to get behind Australians, the Australian economy, and ensure that we can open up as soon as possible, and that is through vaccinations. And it's not through brand shopping. It's not through creating vaccine hesitancy. It's through real information, factual information, not scare campaigns, and not actually out there confusing Australians that are trying to do the right thing. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator McAllister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, a Kinsley gaffe is when a political figure accidentally tells the truth, some obvious truth that isn't supposed to be voiced. And this morning we saw just such an example because the Deputy Prime Minister really belled the cat, didn't he? When pressed on why he wouldn't be reining in Mr Christensen about his, his comments, Mr Joyce said this, I can assure you that when you've got a thin margin, don't start giving reasons for a by-election. It was a moment when the Deputy Prime Minister accidentally it. told the truth that he and the Prime Minister were always keeping an eye on their political interests, even when it involved a member of the government spreading dangerous disinformation vaccines and about lockdowns, the two public health tools that we have to fight the Delta variant. And just to really prove that Mr Joyce meant what he said, the government then that tried to use its numbers in the Senate today to protect Mr Christensen and Senator Canavan, Senator Rennick from being called out for their comments. Well, today, while the government was busy trying to protect its political interests, the ACT joined New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland in lockdowns. More than half of Australia's population is now under some form of COVID restrictions. Now, while the risk of a by-election might be front of mind for Mr Joyce, I doubt that it is a concern for the millions of Australians who would just rather that the Morrison government concentrate on doing its job. These are Australians who will lose their chance to say goodbye to a loved one. These are Australians whose children will be learning from home without contact with anyone their own age for months. These are Australians who will struggle financially because of the economic consequences of the Delta wave that this Prime Minister has overseen. Now, we would not be in this position if the Prime Minister had just done his job. In Newcastle, in my home state of New South Wales, there is an outbreak in an aged care facility and only a third of the staff have received even one dose of the vaccine. These workers were meant to be fully vaccinated by Easter under the Prime Minister's plan. New South Wales towns like Walgett, Burke and Brewarrina have been put into lockdown and these towns have large First Nations populations. But despite the Prime Minister promising that First Nations Australians would be a priority in the vaccine rollout, only 10 per cent have been vaccinated. The Northern Rivers, where I grew up, Lismore, Bangalore, Bar and Casino, locked down. We have been left dangerously exposed by this government's failure to effectively roll out sufficient volumes of the vaccine and to take responsibility for establishing an effective national quarantine system. And Senator Hughes's disgraceful and dishonest contribution just now, unhappily, is typical of the government's response. It's always someone else's fault. It's the opposition's fault. It's the community's fault. It's the workers' fault. It's the Italians' fault sometimes. It's Atagi's fault. It's the Premier's fault. Perhaps today it's my fault if you listen to Senator Hughes. But the truth is, this is the responsibility of this government. 
They are responsibility. They are responsible for the vaccine rollout and they are responsible for hotel quarantine and for a national quarantine system. This government struggles to get the basics right. Official public health information for core communities, two months out of date. This outbreak is affecting communities in southwestern Sydney, migrant communities who may not be confident reading official documentation in English. Despite this, the Arabic translation of the Department of Health's vaccination information doesn't mention that all adults in Greater Sydney should get any vaccine that they can access. Australians are scared. They are scared for their livelihoods, are worried about their family's health. They are wondering when they'll be able to leave the restrictions and the lockdowns behind them. Don't worry, Mr Joyce and Mr Morrison got it in hand. And as I made clear this morning, their number one priority is doing whatever it takes to make sure there isn't a by-election. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. Well, as we come to the end of two weeks in this place, while so much of our country is in lockdown, including here in the ACT from later today, those on the other side continue to repeat the same questions every day and the same attacks. Senator Hughes' description of Groundhog Day couldn't be more appropriate. While they continue to spread lies and mistruths, our government is focused on getting on with the job of keeping Australians safe. While the opposition continues to undermine the rollout, we are getting on with that job and delivering record amounts of over 250,000 shots a day. In the last seven days, over 1.4 million doses have been delivered and over 14.2 million doses have been delivered to date. In fact, since we arrived here in Canberra for this sitting period last week, over 190,000 doses have been delivered. We are getting on with the job. No one is saying that there haven't been problems along the way and it has now been turned around and we are now back on track. Our numbers are comparable with the world's best rates of vaccination. With one million Pfizer doses arriving weekly, a plentiful supply of AstraZeneca and now Moderna approved for use in Australia, it will be great to see the weekly doses increasing over coming weeks. 25 million doses of Moderna have been secured with the first million doses arriving next month. It is a safe, practical vaccine. Madam Deputy President, I would like to acknowledge the hardworking frontline staff who are administering these vaccines. My sister is one of those. They are all working long hours and often under extreme pressure. They, along with all the other health professionals who have been at the forefront of the COVID outbreaks across the country, deserve our thanks. Their commitment to saving Australian lives, putting others before themselves in what is often a thankful task. It's incredible. The ramped up rollout though, roll though is just the start. Not only will the vaccination of Australians help save lives, it will also help us to relax restrictions as we progress through the four stages of the national plan. The current phase obviously is accelerating the vaccination rates and keeping short, sharp lockdowns if possible. The transition phase, when we get to 70 per cent, will see low, low level restrictions and hopefully less lo lockdowns. And by the time we get to con the consolidation phase with 80, 80 per cent of adults fully vaccinated, we will only hopefully have targeted lockdowns. That's the plan. As we lead into the final phase where we can open international borders with no lockdowns and boosters regularly pr being provided if needed. As evidenced by the Doherty modelling, now that we've protected our more vulnerable elderly Australians, it's now possible to shift our focus to younger Australians and they, are now, they now have access to, to more options in regard to vaccinations. And it is wonderful to see the young Australians turning up across the country to get vaccinated. Tasmania, my home state, is leading the way in vaccinations. We reached the milestone of 50% vaccinations last week and as part of Premier Gutwin's four-point Delta Shield plan announced yesterday, they will be boosting vaccination rates over the next weeks to achieve 60% by September. That plan also includes increased fines, tighter border controls, strengthened testing, tracking and tracing and a support package for businesses impacted by interstate lockdowns. They too are getting on with the job. Madam Deputy President, 
I'd like to turn my attention now to earlier this year when here in this place we debated legislation in relation to the freedom of speech, particularly in the context of academic freedom of speech. And I would defend every single person's right to the freedom of speech, particularly those of us elected to parliament to represent all Australians. Universities must be, place, must be places that protect free speech even when it is being said, things said may be unpopular or challenging. The idea of academic freedom is vital to the continued development of our educations. Our universities are critical institutions where ideas are developed, debated and challenged, as is our parliament. As we debated here earlier today, there are vastly differing, differing views about coronavirus, the development of COVID-19 vaccines and the resulting impacts of the virus on border closures, restrictions around events and even how to wash our hands properly. Of course, some of the public debate around COVID we would agree with, and as discussed earlier today, we wouldn't. But that is the very nature of free speech. We're all entitled to our opinion, but there is a line when it puts at risk public safety. Madam Deputy President, I defend everyone's individual right to decide if they'll be vaccinated or not. However, one, anyone who chooses not to should also respect the right of those who do and not vilify or harass those that do. I am fully vaccinated, Madam Deputy President, and coming to that decision, I considered all the commentary in the public arena. However, the overriding decision came down to wanting to protect my family, my community and myself from an insidious, life-threatening oh, illness. Order, Senator Askew. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Mr President. Thank you. Well, you rise to take note of Senator Birmingham and Senator McKenzie's answers to questions. Now, Senator Birmingham spent all his time covering the backs of members of his government when they espouse dodgy health advice. Maybe Senator Birmingham in his answers to those questions could start covering the backs of our mums and dads, our grandparents and children, and holding dodgy government members to account that are giving dodgy health advice. Their failure by this government on a series of uh, levels has been particularly uh, gross. We've seen the grossness of it because of the lack of proper action when it comes to vaccine rollout. Now, I just sort of note in the answers that were given by and comments from others taking note from the government that not one of the senators on the government's side defended the government's silence on their own dodgy government members giving dangerous advice. And the question of freedom of speech is always a critical one. But you need to call out when it's dangerous advice, when it's putting our community at risk, our families and our public and the public. Well, quite clearly, we've seen a failure on a number of levels from this government. Failure to hold dodgy members to account, failure to supply to meet supply necessity, failure to vaccinate, and of course, failure to quarantine. The failure on the vaccine front is an important area. Many people, not because um, uh, they should, I, I have certainly my strong views, I've received AstraZeneca, um, and I suggest that many others should be doing the exact same thing. But clearly amongst the public, because of the government's misinformation, lack of appropriate approach to this health issue, that there is great disquiet right across our community. And of course, Senator Canavan also said that you know, people are just speaking about a particular viewpoint. You know, that's our job. Well, yeah, that, that could, might be your job, Senator Canavan, but the job of, of government members who know the right health advice is to actually espouse it and hold you to account. Now, one of Mr uh, Morrison's own cabinet ministers, Nikki Sava, um, talked about Mr Morrison's philosophy. If you see a problem, throw money at it. If you see a problem, walk away from it. If you see a problem, duck shoves to somebody else. Well, that, this dangerous disinformation being run by government's own party room is just another problem that Mr Morrison is walking away from. And Mr Christensen said, when will the madness end? How many more freedoms will we lose due to a fear of virus which has a survivability rate of 997 out of 1,000? It's time we stop spreading fear 
and acknowledge some facts. Masks don't work. Fact. Lockdowns don't work. Fact. So Mr. Christensen says. I mean, quite clearly, the government is at complete disarray about how they deal with this. Because we've seen, particularly in the situation with Mr. Christensen, the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Joyce, made it clear that he was not going to hold the government to account. He was not going to hold those in the government to account that were giving dodgy health advice. And why? Because of crass political opportunism. Because of the fact that turning them and holding them to account means that they might blow back. Well, guess what? They're blowing back on the Australian community's health. They're blowing back on the outcomes that we need to make sure that we have a successful economy reopened and the lockdowns can cease. And it goes to the very important question where, you know, uh, regional doctor, Dr. Clyde Ronan said at Yoronga uh, Medical Clinic, um, and he said more and more patients with no shows for vaccination bookings due to false ideas circulating in the community. He went to say, everybody seems to be an expert at the moment. We're being saturated with information and not all the information is useful. Otherwise, you get people speaking outside of their expertise. You get people with no expertise at all, and they're all got an, op got an opinion. Well, quite clearly, vaccination hesitancy in this country is the squarely at the feet of the misinformation and disinformation from the government's own members. It's incredibly important they get their acts together and the government holds them to account. The question is the motion moved by Senator O'Neill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move to take note of the question by me to uh, Senator Birmingham, but I note that Senator Rice would like to be making the take note contribution, who's uh, dialling in remotely. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. We are in a climate emergency. The UN Secretary General said this week that it is code red, completely consistent with Greta Thunberg's words that we should be acting as if our house was on fire, because it is. But what response did we get from Senator Birmingham this afternoon? From our government? Basically, it's don't worry, it's just a little fire in the kitchen. You know, we'll, don't worry, we'll get onto it at some stage. Eventually, we'll get the fire extinguisher out, we'll, or perhaps some other technology. I mean, we're meeting our Paris target, said Senator Birmingham. And in fact, whereas in fact our pollution from burning fossil fuels has in fact increased by 6% between 2005 and 2019. And even if we do meet our Paris targets, it's like saying we put the high jump bar just a couple of centimetres above the ground five years ago, and now we're celebrating that, oh, look, we got over it. I mean, basically, our target translates into almost three degrees of global warming, if that was what the rest of the world was agreeing to as well, and which would make the extreme weather that we have been seeing in recent times just the beginning. Meeting our Paris targets, even if we do make that, is not where the global focus is now. This is an emergency and other countries are recognising it. The US has recognised it. They have now got a commitment to slash their carbon pollution by 50% by 2030. The EU recognises it. They are going to be slashing their pollution by 50% by 2030. The UK by over 60% by 2030. We, as Australia, we need to triple our ambition to be consistent with the science, with what the IPCC has laid out so starkly for us this week. We need to be slashing our pollution. We need to have reductions of 75% by 2030 if we are going to be doing our part to be keeping global heating below one and a half degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. I mean, the Morrison government's refusal to act on climate leaves Australia isolated on the world stage. It's us, it's Saudi Arabia and it's Russia. And no one is being fooled, least of all our allies. I mean, the US just this week has publicly rebuked Australia's climate policy. It was an unprecedented public rebuke. I mean, think how strong the private critiques must be if this is what they are willing to say publicly. I mean, one of their key negotiators, Dr Pershing, said the commitments they made in Paris are not sufficient. 
So for all that Senator Birmingham can blather on about technology, the fact is we are burning coal and gas and oil at unprecedented rates. And the rest of the world, our allies, are not impressed. But no, we have got a government that is basically hell-bent at looking after their billionaire mates and their fossil fuel donors, setting fire to our future rather than facing the facts. You only have to look at the subsidies going out the door for the mining and burning of fossil fuels, over $10 billion a year, including committing to be spending $600 million for the Curry Curry gas plant, over $200 million to be supporting and subsidising the fracking of the Beetaloo Basin, releasing an absolute climate bomb on the world. This government is failing in their most basic duty to be keeping us safe. They are burning our children's futures. So we have to take serious action. The IPCC report laid it out very starkly. The alarm bells are ringing. The UN Secretary General said that gas, greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. Billions of people at immediate risk. The temperatures are rising, the ice is melting, the oceans are rising, the reef is dying, the forests are burning. It was 48.8 degrees in Sicily yesterday. The fires around the world, in Greece, in Russia, in the US, in Canada, on the back of our black summer fires, show this is the emergency that we are in. But, so look, we've got to take action. There is hope. We can kick out this destructive planet-burning mob. And with the Greens in balance of power, we can have a government that will push, that the Greens will push the next government to go further and faster on climate. We can adopt science-based targets for 2030. We can shift to abundant green energy. We can stop the mining, burning and export of coal and gas and oil. And we can work with other countries around the world for a positive, healthy future. Question is the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham.